what do we do with these little chunks? Hi, I'm Kent and welcome to Turn a Wood Bull. Today we're going to take these little chunks and hopefully make something really cool out of them. I'm asked often, what can I do with the little cutoffs that come from my turnings, my larger turnings? If you're making bowls that are bigger than 8 or 10 inches, then you're going to have some cutoffs. These cutoffs have been squared up, and this is mulberry and this is cherry. I've been looking at this mulberry piece for a while now, and I really want to do something with this. So I've got an idea, and I think we can make something really nice here. So I want to show you guys that your scraps that you're cutting from your larger bowls can be used to make other bowls. They don't all have to be big to be beautiful. And hopefully this will be a beautiful bowl. So let's get this mounted to the lathe and get started. All right, I'm gonna mount this between centers. I'm using my four spur drive center and the tailstock. Now this is a side grain mounted piece, meaning on this block, two ends are in grain and the opposite two ends are side grain. So I'm going to use my 5 8 inch 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge to rough out the bottom curve of this piece. I want to get that corner out of the way so I'm not getting dinged with those corners as I go by. And this will also allow me to get the tool rest up a little bit closer. All right, so I'm shaping the outside of what's going to be a bowl, but we're going to try something different here. This is mulberry, and mulberry is actually a really beautiful wood. It has very tight grain, and it has a nice yellowish appearance when it's fresh. Of course, it'll dry and become a little bit darker brown, but that's true of most woods. I'm just shaping this curve. Now you have a couple options when you're roughing a blank like this. You can clean up the face and then clean up the edges and then you have a perfect cylinder and then you can start doing this. Or you can kind of just start going at the corners like I am here and kind of just paying attention to the shape that's occurring. I kind of like the fact that this has this curve on it with out of a square block. There's something kind of interesting about that. But I'm going to continue and bring this down so that it's all round and cylindrical. So I, keep, I want to keep that tool rest up close as I'm progressing and stop the lathe and move the tool rest in. I'll keep removing material here so that we've got the side leveled off. Yeah, mulberry is actually a really nice wood to turn, especially if you can find specimens that have large bases where you can make pretty good sized bowls from it. It's actually a really nice tree species to turn. I've got the nose of the flute angled in the direction of the cut, which is very important. You always want the nose angled. We go over to all the details of how to master the bowl gouge in my bowl gouge mastery online course. You're going to want to check that out. If you're interested in getting really good with the bowl gouge, or if you haven't used the bowl gouge and you're thinking about using a bowl gouge, you're going to want to check out that course because we go over everything you're going to need to know to master the bowl gouge. Here I'm cleaning up the face. I don't want to make this a very deep cut. I just want it deep enough that I can smooth off that material. There's a little bit of a low spot. I'm going to take off a little bit more here. Now I'm using my half inch 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge. Yes, both of these bowl gouges have the same bevel profile that just what I prefer to use for a variety of different reasons. I'm going to mark the tenon. And then we'll clear away some material to create the tendon and the shoulder. If you're not already subscribing, please consider subscribing and click that bell. That way you'll be notified each time a new video comes out. You're not going to want to miss any of them. 
So with the tenon cylinder shaped, I'm going to continue making that curve on the exterior of this piece. Mulberry is, there's something really elegant about it. It has a really tight grain and it's, it's pretty up close and it looks good from a distance. It's pretty much true of most of the fruit trees out there. Most of the fruit trees or the fruit bearing trees, they usually have ten, dense wood grain fibers and they're typically very nice for turning. I'm using my spindle detail gouge now to shape the dovetail for the tenon and clean up that little inside edge for that. And then I'll switch back to my half inch bowl gouge and continue shaping the exterior. Here you can see how I'm creating a flowing curve on this. Now, if you're using a tailstock and the tailstock's in your way and it's difficult to you to do a push cut or start a push cut towards the base of that, one technique that you can use, you can see right there how I can only get in so far with the push cut. The base of this is looking a little too thick and bulky, and that's not what I'm trying to achieve. I want this base to be a lot skinnier and a little bit more interesting. So, and I want to see that right now. I don't want to wait until I clear the material from the inside and flip it over. So I'm going to make a few cuts here so that I can visually see the shape that I'm going to eventually create. So I made a push cut against the supported grain direction. That's okay to do if it's a small cut, but you don't want to be doing that frequently because you are going to tear out ingrain fibers. If you need to know more about supported and unsupported grain cuts, check out this video. I've got a video that explains exactly what's so important with the supported grain cuts. If you notice there, I got a kickback and that's because I had left the angle of the flute open just a bit. I've got a video all on that as well. You're going to want to check that out. Those kickbacks that you get typically at the rim or the bottom of the bowl, they happen for a very specific reason. And if you want to solve that mystery and prevent that from happening in the future, then check out this video. All right, so I'm going to use some scraping cuts and then some shear scraping cuts. Now the scraping cuts are when the tool is close to being horizontal or parallel to the, the rails of the lathe. The shear scrape, the handle of the tool is dropped at about a 45 degree angle. And that allows the tool to basically do a very light shaving of material and instead of a deep cut. And with the shear scrape, you can do, you, you're very flexible as far as the direction you're, you can move. You can actually move, it's the only time with the bowl gouge that you can move left and right without there being any consequences. Because it's removing such a thin layer of material, you can, you can go back and forth without the fear of ripping out ingrain fibers. You can see how thin and minute those little shavings are. Now, I was just noticing that this dovetail is not quite as clean as it could be. I'm going to clean this up a little bit. I'm bringing my spindle detail gouge back up there. And now it's time to turn this blank around. So I'm going to take the drive center out. And I'm going to attach my chuck. You want to make sure there, as you saw, there's some debris on the on the tenon of this. You really want to make sure there's no debris anywhere in the, the threads of the, of the lathe or anywhere on this because just a little bit of wood shavings can disturb this. Now, I'm going to make some light cuts here for a couple different reasons. I'm pushing in towards the headstock because I don't want to create a lot of stress with the tenon. And I'm kind of getting a feel for how this piece is going to turn and how stable it's going to be with that tenon in the four jaw chuck. Because I'm going to do something here in just a moment that's going to be a little bit more dramatic or different, I should say. And I want to make sure that the tenon is going to be able to hold this. So I'm, I'm kind of slowing down my pace just to see where we stand 
and everything seems to be pretty good. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, I'm gonna use my narrow parting tool. Now this is a parting tool that's sold by D-Way Tools. And I'll put a link to this tool and all the tools that I use in the description below this video. So check that out if you're interested. I like using this parting tool because it's very sturdy, but it's also very narrow. And what I'm doing is I need a chunk of this center of the bowl to use later for something I've got in mind. So I'm going to part out a section as if I were coring a bowl. The biggest thing you need to take away if you're going to try this with a parting tool is to never go in one path. In other words, don't just bore in in one direction without making extra path, passing cuts here. Because I need to get around the edge and get towards the bottom of this, I'm going to make like a cone shape. I need to turn and cut multiple paths so that I have plenty of space left and right of the parting tool so that it doesn't get bound up in here. If I just go in straight without widening the path, this will bind up and it will catch and it will, it will snag. So instead, you can see how I'm widening this path, which also gives me more access to the base of this shape. Now, this is kind of a no-no. I've told you guys many times not to use spindle tools on side grain mounted bowl blanks. The only exception to that is the fact that this is such a small piece and I'm meticulously opening up this cavity so it's making it very difficult for this tool to catch. So I'm starting back from the beginning and creating a new angle so this gives me more access to the base of this cone. What I want to do is I want to turn down towards the base of this just enough that I can loosen it up and pop it out of there. If you have a piece of exotic wood and you don't want to just turn the center of the piece away in shavings, this is a good technique to use to have an extra chunk of that wood to use for another purpose. You can see how wide I made that path so there's plenty of room for the tool to reach in there and I'm almost at the base of this I don't need to go all the way to the bottom. I'm going to stop the lathe and sure enough it's already loosened itself up. So I just wiggle it a little bit and it'll come free. So now I have this piece to use for something else later on. So I'm going to level off the rim of the bowl and I'll start shaping the interior of this piece. I like to angle the rim down into the bowl, it's just a personal preference. But that'll actually help with the design of this particular piece as well. Now I'm going to use that parting tool to make a nice clean 90 degree ledge here. I'm just going to remove a small amount of material. Now when I've talked in the past about not using spindle tools on a side grain mounted bowl, this is a good example of where you can use a tool like that. And you can see how light I'm making these cuts. There's not a lot of material there to create a catch. It's very, very light cuts, just doing a little bit of scraping at a time. Just a small amount of material. But what I'm trying to do is create a 90 degree ledge that will hold a lid. I'm going to clean up the side there just a bit. Okay, so I'm going to switch back to my half inch bowl gouge. And I'll start removing material from the inside of this bowl. Now the bevel, the size of the bevel from the cutting edge down to the heel is too wide to make a clean cut here. So I'm bringing it up on its side. If you notice, I was up at about a 45 degree angle and making more of an arc. So I start the cut with the flute closed. That way I don't get the kickback. Then I open the flute and continue the cut. Now the other thing I want to do is I want to undercut that rim just a little bit. 
if I just cut down like I'm doing now, it's going to make the bowl feel very big and heavy, like it's a large bowl with a small opening in the middle. So instead, I really want to undercut that rim. So I'm going to continue making these cuts till I get pretty much the curved shaped interior that I want. But I got to take down that rim underneath, or the area underneath the rim rather. And I'm going to do that by reversing the bowl gouge. Now this works only if you're pulling out towards you. And you want to do this very lightly. This is a scraping cut and it's against the supported grain direction. So I will need to sand and smooth out those ingrain fibers there because they are getting ripped out as I'm doing that. Now to pick up this cut, I'm actually starting with the flute almost completely open. And that's a really good way to get a catch. As long as you don't take in too much material, you can get away with doing it. I'm reaching across the lathe and I'm bumping the camera. Sorry about that. It's a tricky position, but I want you guys to see it. That's why I kind of have the camera in here tight. And I'm positioning the bowl gouge so that the flute is open for a couple different reasons. Basically so that the shape of the curve of the nose of the bowl gouge can follow that curve without the heel dragging and creating a imburnished edge behind it. Now I'm going to use my round nose scraper. This is a smaller round nose scraper. I have a larger one. I don't use this often as you know, but when you get into a small piece like this, you can see those ridges and those little gouges that were happening. I'm not able to smooth them out completely with the bowl gouge. So I'm just using this tool to take down the high spots and smooth out those grooves. That's the only reason I'm using this. And I have the bull gouge, or I'm sorry, the round nose scraper angled upward to the left. That's an important little trick. And I've got a video all about that that you're going to want to check out as well. The round nose scraper can actually be really helpful in situations like this for smoothing out any rough areas. All right, so I'm going to sand this clean this this piece up and then we'll carry on the nice thing with the mulberry is it sands really well I'll sand from 180 grit to 220 or 240 to 320 and then that's it now I'm stopping the lathe to work on any trouble areas and smooth them out before I go any farther All right, that's looking pretty good. All right, there are small little stress fractures in the surface here. These don't bother me. I don't think they're going to develop into anything larger. This piece of wood is dried for a long time. So the way I deal with these little surface cracks is to apply some waterproof tight bond glue and then just quickly sand with the grain of the wood. The sanding will create dust, which fills in the top of the glue and it cauterizes that glue so it basically makes those cracks disappear it's like making a filler and filling them all at the same time so I'll sand those smooth and then continue with the sanding process until everything's smoothed out all right so with this piece almost completed i'm going to switch over to the chunk of cherry Of course, cherry is black cherry is another fruit tree, and cherry is one of my favorite woods to turn because it, it's it turns and cuts really well. Plus, it just looks gorgeous once it's been turned into a final piece. So instead of putting this in the bandsaw to shape it into a circle, I'm going to tighten the tailstock there. I need to make sure that stays tight all the time. I'm just going to quickly nibble that edge down until I get down to a cylinder. Just making a simple left to right cutting pass with the nose of the bulk gouge turned in the direction of the cut. Now 
The biggest thing that you can take away from what you're seeing right now is the fact that I am shifting my body weight and I'm moving the bowl gouge parallel to the tool rest independent of the blank. What does that mean? Well, it means that I'm moving this gouge intentionally from left to right and it just happens to be wood in the way that it's cutting. I'm not letting that block of wood dictate how the tool moves, especially when it's rough it can be very easy for that block to kind of kick the bull gouge around. If you put pressure on the tool down into the tool rest and just make the tool make a nice clean path, it will cut that same path in the wood. It sounds simple, but if you've tried cutting a rough blank like that, you can you know what it's like when the wood tries to dictate the direction that the bull gouge is going to move. And it can be very frustrating to have the bull gouge kicked around a whole bunch. If that happens to you, basically apply more downforce in through the tool onto the tool rest and make sure you're shifting your body weight in a nice, even manner. All right, so I'm shaping a tenon and a shoulder on this block of cherry. And now I'm using my spindle detail gouge to shape the dovetail for the tenon. And as you might have guessed, I'm going to use my bowl gouge to shape the outside curve of this bowl. Now I'm calling this a bowl, but I have something else in mind for this. I'm going to see if I can make this fit into that recessed area that we made on the first bowl. So essentially this is going to become a lid. I don't want to call it a lid because we're using all the techniques needed to make a bowl. So really this is a bowl and it's just going to happen that it will be used like a lid. So I'm making a scraping cut here just to remove material and shape the top side of this. The tenon and the shoulder will be there for now, but those will be removed later on. So I'm going to take this off the lathe and switch it around in the chuck. I find this interesting. Doing a smaller project like this where there's multiple pieces and multiple lathe connections, it can be actually pretty time consuming and there's quite a few little things you have to be thinking about. The fun thing about doing a project like this is you have to be thinking a couple steps ahead. You can't just mindlessly go and turn something. You have to be thinking, wait, what am I doing next and how am I going to mount that? It's a fun, it's a fun game to play. It's, I think that's one of the fun things about being a wood turner is lots of times you have to solve problems and figure out what's the best method for getting to the final result. So I don't need quite that much material, so I'm going to remove this down just a bit. That cherry just turns so, so beautifully. Okay, so I'm taking a measurement with my dividers for that inside rim or that ledge, and then I'm going to transfer that measurement onto this piece that I just cleaned up. Now I'm just using the left side of the dividers. I'm not letting the right side touch, but I need to see that the line that's being inscribed is right under the right side of that divider. That's why I hold both sides up there. Of course, you don't want the right divider point gripping the wood because it would get flipped over and thrown at you and that would not be good. So you just want to be really cautious if you use that technique to make sure that the right side of the divider does not touch the wood. So I'm turning what will become the inside portion of this lid 
and I'm taking the first bowl and holding it up there to see if it fits and it's right where I want it to be. I don't want it to fit first. I want the lid to be too wide so that I have to remove a little bit of material. The other thing I'm doing here with the spindle detail gouge is I'm shaving away just a very small amount and I'm tapering it upward meaning that if I cut the very first portion too loose and it's wiggly in there because I tapered that cut it, the inside portion of that will grip tighter as the bowl is placed on it. It's not quite fitting there. I still need to remove a little bit of material. So very carefully, I'm just going to shave away a very small amount of material. Very small amount. This is where I'm tapering that initial cut or the initial edge of this piece. Just a hair. Remember, every cut you make, however deep you cut, this piece is going to be doubled or twice that thickness will be removed from the cylinder. So I can quickly get to where this is too loose and it doesn't fit at all that way. So we don't want that. Instead, we want it to pop on just like that. It's a little bit of resistance, but it holds on. That's what we're looking for. When I started this project, I was thinking that the lid or top portion would sit down inside the mulberry bowl. So you would see the top rim of mulberry with the lid sitting down inside that recessed area I made. But now that I'm looking at this and it's almost the same diameter as the bottom bowl, I think I'm gonna go with that where it fits together pretty snugly. So I'm gonna use my half inch bowl gouge and I'm gonna shape the top portion of this and curve it into the lower portion. And I'm going to use a little bit of a scraping cut to scrape away any of the high spots here. It's just a very light scraping cut. That will help blend the areas together and so will sanding. So I've stepped down to 120 grit. That's going to take off that edge. Now the top portion with the tenon is not going to remain. I want this to curve and be a nice flowing curve over the top of this piece. So here you can see with the two tenons that we basically made two bowls that fit together. All right, so I'm going to set that aside for now. And then I'm going to put that in the chuck and I'm going to shape the inside of the lid or the inside of the top bowl. I'm going to introduce the tool at about 90 degrees. and then turn away the center. So what I'm doing here is lightening up this lid and making it lighter so as opposed to being solid wood. Now both of these pieces of wood were harvested by myself and it's something that anybody can do. It, there's a lot of information that you need to know about how to process wood. And that's why I've got the online course, Treatable Understanding Green Wood. If you have somebody that brings over a bunch of logs for you to turn, or if you're processing an entire tree, everything you need to know of what to do to prepare raw wood for bull blanks is covered in that course. You're gonna to wanna to check it out. All right, with the inside of this lid done, I'm going to sand this. I have to be very careful and not to over sand it because it does have a relatively snug fit. If I sand it a little too long, 
it can all of a sudden have a very loose fit that doesn't doesn't fit anymore to the bottom section. Now I'm going to hand sand that center portion and then we'll snap that back on. Take a look at it. It's looking good. Okay, so now I'm going to take this whole piece and flip it over and we'll mount this to the lathe with the original bowl on the bottom. Part of the fun of doing a project like this is figuring out all of the moves and now I need to shape the lid of this so what I'm going to use is gaffer's tape. Gaffer's tape is something you probably see me use in other videos it, it holds really well and does not leave a lot of residue so it's perfect for a situation like this so we really need to make sure that lid fits nice and snug and there's no play in it and then I'm simply going to tape it in place and then shape the top of this box now so this is two bowls that came together to basically form a box, a lidded box. It's a little distracting to have that wobble of the tape going on there, but there's, there's really no way to put the tape on perfectly straight. So instead of looking at that wobble, I'm looking at the wood at the nose of this piece, and I'm just shaping that. And I don't want to get too aggressive with the shaping going up to the tape. I need it to merge in with that area. So I'm using light scraping cuts and shear scraping cuts to shape the nose or the top of this piece. Now remember, the tailstock is giving us a little bit of support, but it is not necessary now because the tape is holding this piece in place. Now I want to, I want to leave that little nub there for as long as possible just to have the added support of the tailstock. So I'm going to shape this and get the curve just the way I want before I remove that nub. <laughs> that tape really makes this piece look like it's not mounted square. Okay, so I'm going to get in here with my spindle detail gouge. and just clean up this curve. What I'm doing there is I'm, I'm looking at the overall shape. I want this to be one flowing curve that goes right over the top of the lid. I don't want it to come to a point. This is important to make very light cuts. Don't want to get aggressive here. And I want to keep that shape continuous. going to see what happens. I'm going to put a little pressure on there and pop that off and then I'm going to scrape that level. There's a little bit of a high spot there which is fine. Scrape that level. I'm just using the bottom wing to do the scraping and I'm getting that curve just right now. The other thing that's neat with the tape is that it's it is a fabric tape so you can split it. This actually is from a, a wider roll that was twice as wide as this. So I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little section of this off. And I want to make sure, the reason I'm doing this is I want to make sure that the area that I just turned blends in with the curve below it. I don't want there to be a really hard edge. And one of the ways to make that transition smooth is just to sand those areas together. So I'm going to make sure there's no residue. It's looking pretty good and it's still holding. Of course we have less tape holding now so we really want to be delicate here and not apply much pressure. And it's looking good. Yeah, really nice. I love the way cherry looks. Especially when it's just finished being turned and sanded. It's gorgeous wood. Okay, so I'm going to drill a small hole, and I need to mark the depth of this so I don't go too far. But I'm going to drill a small hole to mount a pole on this lid. So I'm going to move the tailstock up, then I'm going to work the quill in just deep enough to cut to that depth. 
And that's it. That's all we need right there. So the lid for this box is now complete. And I can take the tape off. And look at that. Very, very nice. Now the only trick with doing what I just did is you kind of have to guesstimate the inside curve and the outside shape. But there's enough extra material there. It's not a problem. Now I've got to get back to that little part that I carved out. It's a weird little shape and I need to flatten one of the sides. So I'm going to mount it just lightly in the bottom of this chuck so I can flatten one of the sides. Now, design-wise, there are, there are several things you can do to make things interesting. You can have an alternating pattern between two colors or textures. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the base be mulberry and the handle or the pole on the lid be mulberry with the cherry in the middle. And that's why I saved this section in the inside of the mulberry just so I had a little piece that I can use for the very top of the lid. Now I'm mounting this between centers, but again, this is side grain oriented wood. And this piece is not going to be very large. I probably could have gotten a dinky little chunk off the side of this piece before I even started turning. If I had taken that to the bandsaw and cut the corners off, I could have had a little chunk like this to be working with. But I wanted to show you guys how you can take a section out of the center of a small bowl using a parting tool. So I'm taking this down to the thickest diameter that I'll need for the top pull, which is not very big. It doesn't need to be that big. That's looking pretty good right there. So now I need to get a better grip on this. So I'm going to use my pin jaws. Now my pin jaws are one inch thread and I have a one and a quarter inch thread. So I need to use this adapter which brings the headstock down to a one inch thread. And then I'll mount this chuck. Now I really should have put a shoulder on here which I didn't but we'll make do with what we've got here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take away material on the end of this that matches that hole that we drilled. This will be the little stem that will go down into that hole and be mounted to the lid. I'm just using my parting tool to part away some material. The parting tool is a spindle tool and it's really designed to peel away material that is mounted end to end. It's not designed to do, be used on side grain pieces like this, but this piece is so small that it's not that big of an issue. I'm using my half inch bowl gouge. You can see how small this piece is. This is my half inch bowl gouge, which usually looks pretty small, but here it looks very large. And I'll just do a quick check. We don't want it to fit immediately. If, we, if it fits immediately, it's most likely too small and it's going to move around. So we want it to be too big and then we'll work down to the size that we need. I'm also going to taper this so if the end goes in very easily it should snug up a little bit as it goes. That will also make it easier to get a, a good tight fit. Okay so with the stem established we can start shaping this handle. And I'm going to use my spindle detail gouge for this. This is going to be a small piece. The chunk inside these jaws is actually much larger than what I need. So there's another design trick. So we use the repeating textures which is mulberry, cherry, then mulberry. And we're going to do another design technique which is mimicry. 
we are mimicking the shape of the entire piece, the base and the lid, in this handle. I need a little more material exposed. This is where if I had the shoulder there, this would line up a lot easier. But I'm going to hold this in place. It's not going to line up perfectly, but it's going to be good enough to work with. So what I'm doing is I'm shaping this little pull handle to have the same contour as the entire box. So it, the base portion is wide and then gets narrower at the bottom. And then the lid is the reverse of that, but shorter. These are all design features that can be done and they become pleasing to our eye because we look at this handle and we think this looks familiar and it looks familiar because we're holding the whole box and it is the exact same shape or very similar to the same shape. When I first started doing turnings right next to the jaws like that, I was pretty nervous, but then I discovered that the jaws of chucks do not have the same hardened steel that the couch has. Now, of course, you can get a catch with it, but it's not going to catch and just grind up the tool. The thing that will give the most will be the jaws, not your bowl gouge. Of course, you don't want to hit those jaws, but it's kind of reassuring that if you do accidentally, it's not going to be that big of a deal. So now I need to get in here to get enough space to bring in that narrow parting tool to separate this handle from the original stock. So here you can see the base of the bowl going up into the lid, just like the piece itself. So when we repeat or create mirrors of designs, it becomes pleasing to our eye or People see this and they feel comfortable with it because they think, well, we see this shape in the bowl and we see the shape in the handle and it just has a pleasing appearance to it. And you want to be really careful. This thing is so small that if it did fall to the floor, it could easily disappear and I don't want that to happen. So we'll take this off the lathe. And then I will sand the top of that by hand. Mm -hmm. I'm moving it around frequently to, so I don't wear out one edge more than the other, but I'm moving it around and smoothing off that top. It's incredible how small that piece is from that big chunk that we extracted from the center. Now the plus of doing this is that the wood grains match the bottom bowl. Could this have been done more efficiently in a, some other method? Yes, of course it could be. So I'm going to use five minute epoxy to adhere that handle to the lid of the bowl. I put one part of hardener and one part of epoxy together. It's just a small amount that I need. Mix that together real quick with the toothpick. And that's a nice little trick too. If you need to do a mix like this just use a piece of masking tape it gives you a good solid work surface and when you're done you can just peel it up and throw it away so i'm putting a little bit of epoxy both in the hole and around the stem on the handle unfortunately i got a little too much in there and i had a little ooze out i should have cleaned it up but it uh, wasn't visible to me too much right there. I should have taken a little time and cleaned that up. So I'm applying tried and true Danish oil. This is pure linseed oil. It's pure boiled linseed oil with no chemical additives, no metals, no dryers, nothing like that. And from two pieces of scrap wood, we have this beautiful final piece. Look at that. There's the lid with the matching handle. The handle matches the base. And there's the mulberry base. Absolutely gorgeous. Love this piece. It's incredible you can have a piece of scrap wood that potentially could be a gift that you can give to somebody that looks this beautiful. I love those wood grains. What a fun piece. 
For two little chunks of scrap wood, this turned out pretty cool. I'm really liking the shape of this, and you know what? This a project is essentially two bowls. This lid is just a small bowl that fits over this other bowl. Now, I also showed you a way to extract a small piece of wood from the interior of the bowl. Mind you, this could have been done a lot more efficiently, but this gives you an idea, especially if you have an exotic piece of wood or a one-of-a-kind one of kind piece of wood that you want to remove a little bit of the material from the inside to use for something else. You can use a parting tool very carefully, like I showed you, and you can get a section of that wood out. And that's probably going to be the best way, especially for a small piece like this, because there's no coring equipment that's going to be able to do much here. So the small parting tool works really well. All in all, I really like this. This makes a really nice gift and essentially two bowls makes a box. It's kind of a fun project. I hope you've liked this. If you have, leave me a comment below. And if you've liked the video, click that like button. I greatly appreciate that. And be sure to subscribe if you're not already subscribing. Check out my website, turnawoodbowl.com. Over there, I've got everything you need for turning wood bowls, including online courses that are going to quickly accelerate all of your skills. So check it out. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. And as always, until next time, happy turning.